my pleasure to welcome you back to the next session of our uh, panel uh, presentations. Um, the Head Neck Society is very excited about uh, this uh, component of the meeting. Um, these two topics are critical to our day-to-day -day function, but often receive uh, less uh, uh, of a uh, presentation at our, our core academic meetings. We all deal with ethical dilemmas uh, in our daily work uh, and in our professions, but um, often we don't have a proper framework or uh, a way of approaching these in a reproducible and meaningful fashion. And so we've asked this panel to address this issue uh, to help us as we go forward. Uh, Andrew uh, Schumann will uh, direct and moderate this. Andrew is an associate professor in the Division of Head and Neck Oncology and the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Michigan. He is the chief of the Clinical Ethical Service and the, in, in the Center of Bioethics and Social Services in the Department of Medicine at the University of Michigan. Um, he's also the ENT section chief at the VA uh, in Ann Arbor. Andrew also uh, served a critical role as the vice chair in the ethics and professionalism service of the HNS and was eminently responsive uh, during the early aspects of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, providing a salient uh, ethical uh, foundation and framework for the organization and uh, for the profession in his publications. And so with that, I uh, welcome Andrew and this uh, great panel. We look forward to your thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Deschel. It's truly our privilege and pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you to the organizers, uh, both through uh, HNS as well as COSM. Um, the format of this session will be a, a little bit different. Uh, our plan is to give a brief overview of some ethical principles and background, uh, which we will use some slides for, but the vast majority of this time will be a discussion. Uh, we would love for it to be interactive as well, so please use the, the feature to ask questions or make comments that we will integrate within our conversation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Buczyk uh, uh, joins us uh, from UAB, Dr. Langerman from Vanderbilt, Dr. Shindo uh, from OHSU, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, each individual's backgrounds as we get forward here. Uh, none of us have any uh, relevant disclosures related to this content. So I'm not going to belabor the point of background slides on COVID. Um, number one, uh, we all uh, uh, have uh, lived that for the past year. And number two, uh, yesterday's session was so uh, uh, timely and thoughtful uh, dealing with uh, the myriad issues that arise. Uh, but what we do aim to do over the next hour or so is to talk a little bit through the ethical dimensions of what COVID has done to healthcare systems, regions, and individuals, uh, patients and faculty. Uh, also to talk about how different components of healthcare uh, contribute to inequities and demonstrate um, the considerations necessary uh, to pandemic response and how they're different fundamentally from those in uh, quote unquote normal times. So the three uh, rubrics that we'll deal with involve public health stewardship, distributive justice, and the concept of non-abandonment. Uh, public health stewardship simply talks about the fact that clinical ethics differs from public health ethics. And we live this every day as head and neck cancer providers. Uh, generally speaking, we are taking care of individual patients in front of us as part of a singular clinician patient relationship. You and I will do everything in our power to uh, maximize the uh, care and attention and needs of the patient sitting in front of us. Uh, doing so by definition, means that we're not always thinking about the greater good for society or for all patients writ large. However, when we think from a public health metric, uh, it is different. That is not a patient-centered principle approach, but rather one that thinks about populations and the needs of populations, which may uh, override the needs of an individual patient. Uh, I, for one, feel profoundly uncomfortable taking that position uh, as a doctor uh, who's taking care of an individual patient. My job is to make sure that individual has what they need. Uh, and when there's extrinsic forces or viruses or edicts that prevent me from doing so, that's very difficult for me and my patient. And I'm sure for you, likewise. Uh, we've all seen the need to flatten the curve. Uh, I uh, am uh, speaking from uh, the national hotspot uh, of the fourth surge right now uh, in Michigan. Uh, we are uh, unfortunately dealing with uh, yet another surge in cases that are straining our resources. And uh, we, again, are taking steps that maximize the need for public health stewardship while in many ways disenfranchising individual patients. Uh, this week, we've uh, shut down uh, the ability for uh, folks to visit the hospital, and we could talk about visitor policies in a little bit, but 
uh, again, I only bring that up because it is indeed happening again. And generally speaking, it's anathema for us to delay or refuse medically necessary care. That's not what we do. That's not who we are. That's not how we were trained. And that's not how uh, we were um, uh, envisioning our practice. And individualized rationing decisions don't necessarily play a role in day-to-day -day care, but we need to act differently now than we ever used to. And COVID has created and engendered a situation in which the normal road and pathway to care may not be possible due to extrinsic forces out of our control, whether that's bed availability, mask availability, uh, public health needs uh, to flatten a curve or limit bed admissions or whatever it might be. And one challenge uh, with a principle-based approach is that these principles are in diametric opposition. You simply can't do what everybody wants all of the time. We can't provide the best care for every individual patient uh, in a way that uh, prevents harms uh, because quite frankly, people are going to get hurt. There are trade-offs that are inherent to these decisions. And being just or being fair uh, sounds wonderful, but it's incredibly difficult to do while honoring the other principles. Uh, so I see principalism as a wonderful way to explain ethical dilemmas, but not always the best way to solve them. I think the prior session is a perfect example of how inherent disparities related to uh, institutionalized racism, um, circumstance, uh, and other factors within our broken healthcare system uh, have created a system and a society in which healthcare is not just, uh, despite our best intentions. And part of this all comes down to the need to balance individual patient interests with the welfare of all of our patients. And that can be contextualized for all of our patients as an individual, as an institution, as a state, or as a society. This is a quote that came out early in the COVID pandemic, and I think it's particularly uh, striking. Uh, this was written by an oncologist in Utah uh, in the New England Journal. Uh, and it talks about the concept of a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, for those uh, who need to brush up on your uh, classics, uh, Pyrrhus was a general uh, who uh, was willing to sacrifice his entire army to win the battle, only to not have enough soldiers to fight the next battle. So the idea here is that if we delay cancer care in order to uh, avoid risk for COVID, then we're potentially only delaying the, the failure, uh, delaying the sacrifice, uh, whether it's due to cancer or COVID. Uh, and again, uh, I was hoping and praying that this was a conversation that would be out of date by now, uh, but it certainly is not. Uh, Dr. Deshley mentioned that the HNS uh, Ethics and Professionalism Service, among many others uh, on this call and in this meeting, have put out some incredibly thoughtful frameworks and workflows uh, for how to uh, deal with uh, COVID-related uh, barriers to providing care. Uh, the COVID versus cancer um, uh, edition of Head and Neck uh, summarizes these beautifully in addition to a number of other publications, uh, which we will be referencing throughout the next hour or so. Uh, and again, I'm just going to tout one of them. Uh, this was uh, a beautiful paper that came out uh, in cancer this past year, uh, spearheaded by the Toronto group, uh, but uh, took um, uh, a really um, uh, evidence-based uh, approach to uh, come up with a way to um, prioritize cancer care, head and neck cancer care uh, in the COVID era. Uh, again, uh, not that everyone needs to use this tool, but I simply put this up as a reference for really uh, the, the gold standard for how to do this work thoughtfully, creatively, carefully, and in a multidisciplinary manner. Uh, the AMA had a quote regarding professional responsibility, which is the final rubric I'll talk about here. Uh, this was three years predating COVID's uh, emergence. Plagues and pandemics respect no national borders in a world of global commerce and travel. Through the centuries, individual physicians have fulfilled this obligation by applying skills and knowledge competently, selflessly, and at times heroically. Our profession must reaffirm its historical commitment to combat natural and man-made assault on health and well-being. Humanity is indeed our patient. Pretty prescient words uh, to be written three years before uh, the plague that has stricken us. When we talk about levels of obligation, uh, it's always interesting to think about which side of the fire we are on. Uh, the gentleman on the left of the screen uh, is a good Samaritan who walked literally into a burning building to save an elderly man who had succumbed to smoke inhalation with no mask, with no protective equipment. Uh, that is a heroic action by any uh, metric. 
Uh, the gentle uh, man, well, I shouldn't say man, I don't know if that's a man or a woman, but the firefighter on the right of the screen uh, is uh, similarly heroic. Uh, but this firefighter is doing uh, the job assigned um, with the necessary mask, with the necessary protective equipment, which does bring to bear what our level of obligation is uh, in a pandemic. One way to think about this with, is with regard to permissible uh, versus impermissible action uh, on the part of a professional. And I would argue that that fire, firefighter is doing what is obligatory. Um, going into harm's way because that is indeed the job at hand and you have the necessary equipment to protect yourself. Uh, the gentleman on the left of that screen, however, was acting in a super erogatory way. It morally exceeds what is obligatory. And one way to frame and think about our professional obligation as providers during a pandemic is whether or not we are fulfilling obligatory, neutral, or super erogatory roles. When we are asked to staff a field hospital or trach uh, the patient with COVID or just go to work every day in your office, uh, depending upon the circumstance, uh, that may be considered obligatory, neutral, super erogatory, or perhaps even impermissible if you don't have the necessary tools to protect yourself and those around you. So with that framework, I'm going to stop my sharing and um, open it up to the panel uh, for further discussion. Uh, we have some uh, prepared questions and comments uh, but uh, more importantly, I would like to uh, utilize this time as a way to invite all of you to ask questions and to share uh, uh, your perspectives. So I'm going to start with Dr. Buchik. Um, how has the pandemic tested and changed our perspective on professionalism and what it means inherently to be a professional? Oh, still muted. You'd think by now I'd, I'd get that down, sorry. Um, I, what I was saying is that I think before the pandemic hit, professionalism was something that we all inherently did, was very uh, you know, ingrained in who we were as physicians, as head and neck providers. When the pandemic hit, I think it brought to the forefront, like it did many things, um, a lot of the concepts and principles that we took for granted. Um, you know, when we talk about teaching residents professionalism, we talk about carrying out your professional responsibilities, adhering to ethical principles, and, you know, serving a diverse patient population. But what happens, and what COVID did, is what happens when you exponentially and quickly take that level of stress and fear, and what happens when those things that used to work in concert suddenly start becoming in conflict with each other. For instance, you know, you have, I started considering what are our professional responsibilities and to whom? We have responsibilities to our patients, to ourselves, to our colleagues, um, to our trainees, to our families. Um, and what COVID did at, at, you know, very fast too, with very little time to think about it was immediately put some of those responsibilities in direct conflict. And so I think it, it truly challenged us to rapidly turn on a dime about how we approach not just care, but how we approach interacting with each other um, in a you know in a group setting as a national setting, um, and how we approach training. Everything um, was immediately you know put in the forefront and 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 very difficult. I think you know I mentioned too a second ago. I think fear too in the beginning at least of all of this really um, was something that, you know, we're not used to experiencing as providers ourselves um, and then increased fear in our patients. You know, how did we tackle that? What did we do with that? Um, I'd love to hear what others think about that as well. It's interesting that you mentioned the whole idea of kind of coming together. I was reflecting upon this that you know, in addition to the many things that the pandemic brought on as a change in our professional roles, um, learning in depth about something that's frankly completely out of my normal academic clinical comfort zone, you know, infectious disease and epidemiology and things that I, I you know, learned in medical school, but never really studied to that depth. Uh, and suddenly not only am I, you know, to explain that to my, you know, friends or family or, uh, you know, make decisions about my own safety, but, you know, our patients are coming to us and really expecting us to have a fair amount of answers about um, that. In, in, in part, it's because we need to be able to provide that information for informed consent and decision-making about their uh, disease. But 
just in general, I'm, you know, when I see patients in clinic that, well, should I get the vaccine? You know, and I mean, it's easy to just say, yes, you should definitely get the vaccine, but to give a more nuanced answer or counter those uh, objections that patients have or the misunderstandings uh, or, or saying, well, you know, is it smart to get my surgery now versus should we wait a month or two, you know, and making those decisions and, 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 and helping patients understand that was never a clinical decision making that, that was something I incorporated in. And I think that that, um, that was both, and to get back to, I think your comment that I love so much, that was both something that was a new uh, task for us, but I think it's something that also brought us as a profession together. You know, it broke down those barriers between uh, the different specialties to say we're all in this kind of big thing that we're all doing together, you know, uh, across uh, um, uh, different professions and across different specialties. And, uh, you know, furthermore, uh, breaking down those barriers was the, the idea of my surgery you know, we think about like my patient first, which, uh, you know, Andy mentioned, and I think is really one of the, the hardest things for all of us, you know, as surgeons in particular to swallow because we're right there to do the thing on that one person. Um, but it's not just, well, my patient over say, you know, my colleagues, you know, let's all debate and say which of our patients is the most critical, but actually across all patients of all different specialties, again, Things I didn't really appreciate or know about before is the decision making in, you know, breast oncology or in, you know, orthopedic surgery or how those other things might outweigh some of the things that we're trying to do. So I think that was a really uh, big challenge, but an exciting way to bring our entire medical profession together. Um, so I love, I love what you said there. Dr. Shindo. Oh, sorry, muted. You think I'd get that down by now, <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, um, I, professionalism, you know, during the early outbreak of the pandemic was a real struggle from every respect. Because I, I'm when I look at things, I try to um, focus on evidence-based data and how I practice. And the problem was that there was, just wasn't a whole lot of concrete evidence-based data in terms of the false negative rate and you know um so and and not only not only and, and Aaron you brought up okay you have to consider your patients uh but then you know there's ethical dilemma about your staff who work with you and the subsequent patients who are going to be walking into your office you know you have to you have an ethical obligation to protect them as well. Um, so these were big struggles. And the other struggle that I had was everybody had a different approach to this pandemic. Some, some didn't believe this, you know, um, where I was at, it wasn't as severe as many like New York and Michigan and some of these other places. And so some were not as great about adhering to all the policies and you know, I would walk around um, and I would see people, for example, not wearing a mask. And I would, you know, what's my, the, how do I, in a professional way, tell this colleague or even somebody who may be more superior and say, hey, you have to put this mask on. I mean, that, you know, am I unprofessional by calling somebody out on that? Um, so these were a lot of the other struggles in addition to what, what you all mentioned that I was going through. And I'm still struggling with that a little bit, but um, I don't have a right or wrong answer. I think I, I just felt like I had to do the best that, I, I did what I, the best that I could um, and protect all the patients, not just my patient, protect the staff, the team members who work with me, that's including residents and, and you know, all the, nurses and the MAs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then try to be a professional when you deal with everybody else around you. Um. I think staying on that professionalism uh, vein and, and talking through the um, different roles we play in, in a healthcare system is, is another important component. So even focusing within uh, our field, um, uh, within otolaryngology, uh, perhaps certain faculty may have taken 
more of a frontline stand than others uh, in terms of uh, their uh, involvement with uh, critically ill COVID patients, as well as uh, those in the outpatient world. Uh, certainly, uh, residents and other trainees may have uh, either been closer to the front line than others. Uh, uh, and I wonder your perspective uh, as leaders uh, within your institution, but also within your field of how that played out in terms of emulating professionalism uh, and who was, so to speak, at that front line um, uh, in terms of the early pandemic, but even moving forward uh, uh, into the, the next phases. Perhaps we can start with Dr. Langerman on that one. I mean, it's an interesting question because, you know, I, I felt like you know, my role as a head and neck, I mean, we're H&S, so we're mostly head and neck oncologists of different sorts, but, you know, um, some of us do uh, more urgent cases, some of us do less urgent cases. And I was in that camp where, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really able to slow down. We didn't have much of a, a block on the kind of cases that I do. I mean, plenty got canceled, but there were plenty still to do and they just got done sooner. You know, bigger head and neck cases, cases that couldn't really you know, realistically wait. And so I, th I thought it was, in that sense, it was very interesting to me to begin to reflect later on the challenge that other physicians had modeling professionalism in a time when they weren't able to uh, do our, their normal job. And I think that's very valid, you know, and I, I watched some colleagues struggle with that. Whereas my showing up to work, I felt sort of fulfilled that role, you know, and, and showed up to work as a, you know, we have a duty and helping my junior colleagues and my residents wrestle with their own fears and talk openly about it, I think was really important. Um, but uh, I, I felt like those of us that had to do the work uh, uh, at the initial surge uh, we're both unfortunate and lucky in different ways and, and lucky in the sense of, I think it was pretty straightforward that when you showed up, you were modeling that professionalism there, um, you know. Dr. Shindo? Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, our residents, I mean, fortunately, I do predominantly endocrine surgery, but even with endocrine surgery, we still from time to time need to do aerosol generating procedures like bronchoscopy when you have an invasive tumor. So, you know, obviously during the pandemic, we were only treating the very advanced cancers. So, um, you know, we were seeing more of those very advanced cancers because nobody else wanted to, to touch them. Um, but that said, um, you know, our frontline individuals were the residents. And I felt an obligation to make sure that, you know, they felt protected um, and I took the time to at least, you know, reach out to them from time to time um, when they've had exposure. And so I was one of, I'm one of the peer supporters for our institution. Um, and so I've been involved with at least peer supporting. I think during that time, you know, part of um, trying to be very professional uh, and taking care of your team members who were actually dealing with more of the frontline issues. Um, you know, I try to at least contribute by uh, doing some peer supporting and ensuring that they felt safe. And that's, that's not just the resident, that's also the staff in the office, you know, um, who may be a little bit uncomfortable after uh, aerosol generating procedure, you know, following a skull-based tumor resection, they had just done a clean out in that room. Uh, I don't, I think that, you know, we don't think about those, you know, the, the staff who have to walk into that room after that to kind of clean everything out. And there's, you know, a lot of fear. Um, and I think we could be very professional by thinking about those around us, um, the OR nurses, the clinic, you know, the clinic staff. Yeah, and I'd, I'd echo a lot of what Alex and Maisie just said. I think you know, we didn't think about it at the time, but being, you know, within our department, the head and neck division, like Alex, like you said, you know, the wheel didn't stop turning for head and neck cancer. Like we just kept right on going. And we were fortunate in the beginning that we were able to continue to do that. Um, and I didn't think at the time about, I suppose a lot of my colleagues here were sitting at home and couldn't do anything. At least I had, a, uh, I felt like we as head and neck providers had a sense of 
um, you know, satisfaction that, that we were able to contribute meaningfully. And like Maisie, like you said, be there to support people, even if we weren't necessarily operating or doing patient care, just contributing to the overall group. Um, I feel like we took it upon ourselves to, to really, you know, be there to educate the residents as best we could. It was sort of, you know, learn as fast as you can and educate as fast as you can, uh, um, just absorbing information every day. But yeah, you know, I think just what's unique about our specialty is that we, we didn't, I wouldn't say we didn't have a choice, but we were actually able to continue to provide care in a lot of inst instances, not everywhere though, of course. Now I'll come to you, Dr. Shindo, on that topic. So, so you are a national uh, leader in, uh, in endocrine surgery and really helped uh, write some of the ethical frameworks for thinking about endocrine surgery uh, early in the pandemic. Um, can you speak either to your institutional uh, or your um, uh, broader approach uh, uh, to prioritization and how you thought about these issues uh, from your own vantage point? Yes, yeah, so um, in parallel to the rest of the head and neck group, uh, we formed a multidisciplinary uh, group and I propose that we look at evidence-based data um, and then make some decisions on given our resources, uh, who we would actually allow, to, you know, to be operated on, and who we wouldn't. Um, who would just, you know, we would have longer, you know, conversations and just tell the patient, "You need to wait. I think this is the best thing for you." Um, so we we included, um, you know, all the stakeholders, uh, and that that's, you know, because endocrine surgery um, and just like other aerodigestive tract malignancies, you know, you have multiple discipline, disciplines who are, are taking care of this. So my general surgery colleague, um, you know, and then the other head and neck uh, team members who also do endocrine surgery, we sat down and, and I proposed a list of, you know, procedures and this is what we're going to do. Um, is everybody okay with this? So we just came up with um, a list and prioritized uh, and, we all agreed upon it, signed off on it, and that was our institutional guidelines on what we were going to do. And then we had to make decisions about aerosol generating procedures, i.e. scoping. Um, and uh, I made a conscious decision and I, I proposed that we do not uh, do fiber optic laryngoscopy in the office unless it was absolutely necessary. So for example, it, that it was going to change the decision of whether you're going to operate on this patient or not and somebody who's had prior surgery and you're just not sure whether they have a core paralysis. And if they did, then, you know, we had a protocol, you know, that we get COVID tests. Um, so that's, that's what we did. And the same thing with the head and neck group, you know, they also um, formulated uh, guidelines uh, with oral surgery and amongst themselves on who would get what form of treatment. Um, there's a question in the chat that I'd like to address. I'm going to paraphrase it a bit, um, and it's somewhat contentious. Uh, so uh, the financial ramifications of ramping down uh, operating rooms is formidable, and many of us know that, and we're part of those conversations. Uh, the question regarding the ramp back up and how finances may play a role uh, in that uh, are contentious. Uh, and the bottom line is, unless we're operating and generating RVUs, we're not going to be able to pay to keep the lights on and pay our own salaries as a institution. Uh, and there's something to be said that um, uh, revenue generating fields uh, may have an argument uh, for prioritization on the ramp up. Now, of course, um, that cannot and should not supersede the needs of individual patients who have higher acuity uh, needs. Uh, but I do think that it's reasonable for that to be on the table of discussion uh, for how this plays out in practice. And I know it did at many of the institutions that I, that I spoke with. Uh, Dr. Langeman, I'll start with you on this one. Um, thoughts on how financial factors play back into that ramp up in a way that can be transparent, but also fair? Yeah. So when we're talking about revenue generating procedures, the idea is something that may not be urgent, but has a high reimbursement, you know, private insurance. Um, you know, I'm just going to, I'm not picking on a specialty, but spine surgery or something. Is that kind of what we're talking about here? 
Yeah, and even within uh, uh, you know our own field, uh, there are uh, of course procedures that may generate more money than others uh, in a way that impacts not just the individual surgeon but also the hospital system. Sure. Uh, so yes, spine is a great example, but I would argue there, there's probably some of those within our own field sure. as well. I won't pick on any of our own colleagues. We'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. But uh, um, <clears throat> you know th that's a really really interesting question, and it's 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 sort of there was a, as the arc of the question happened, it was sort of like, oh yeah. And I was like, ooh, wait a minute. That, that doesn't quite sound quite right. There's a certain ick factor with the idea of, oh, just, you know, we, we need to make the money in part because this kind of harkened back to the idea of the calling. You know, if we were in it for the money, we wouldn't be strapping on the N95 and going in to take a cancer out when it's a threat to our lives or our family lives, you know, whatever that degree of threat may be. But uh, an institution has to remain solvent, and that has a long tradition in clinical ethics. You know, when you think about uh, cases where there might be particular patients who have extremely financially burdensome problems and are perhaps not contributing themselves to preventing those problems, and you begin to question to what degree does a hospital need to be obliged to take care of those patients over time, that's a whole other discussion. But the point is, a factor in that is you know, for the greater good, something we think about a lot in the pandemic, for the greater good, hospitals need to remain solvent. The question then becomes, where do you use resources to, you know, maintain that solvency versus resources for other needs? And, you know, my, the, the gut instinct would be that that would be pretty low on the chain, you know, that, that we would expect, um, you know, much like the entire health system is taking a hit that we would expect the um, uh, hospitals to be a part of that unfortunate, you know, and, and then we would all raise our boats together. <clears throat> However, I could see scenarios where alternative, you know, would you save rooms in the main operating room that would otherwise be used for patients who have dire need and have been waiting because of the pandemic and have something that is really significantly impactful on their health and well-being and take that away to say, but you know, we have someone who has an elective surgery that's going to make the hospital a ton of money. We better just do that instead. It just it doesn't read as any kind of within any kind of moral code I can think of. However, say repurposing an ASC to provide care for low risk patients in high revenue generating procedures, which is really what hospitals are doing anyways, but you know, that might be a, a, you couldn't possibly do your big whack there anyways. You couldn't take care of the sickest patients there anyways. And so repurposing some of those resources and report, you know, and, and I think you can talk about the physical resource, but there's also the staff resource. And these are staff members who are going to be um, uh, trained, not necessarily for the big whacks, for those, you know, um, I had a colleague who, wrote a really nice paper talking about the, the use of staff resources. And his example was when you're thinking about repurposing staff, um, he's a pediatric oncologist and to be certified in pediatric oncology nursing is a very special certification. And so the argument is, would you take away those resources from kids with cancer and, and repurpose those nurses to then take care of uh, ICU patients or something else? And, and maybe you would put those people on the lowest tier of someone who'd be repurposed because their usefulness is so important elsewhere. Well, you know, when you have resources of nurses who are more used to the ASC environment, less trained for the more complex surgeries at the bigger hospital, that's a resource pool that you could use for those kind of elective cases that might be making money. So danced around the topic a little bit, you know, kind of hammering home. I don't think anyone should lose their, you know, cancer care for, to make money. I don't think anyone should ever be prioritized based on their insurance status for how we care for patients. It, you know, that was never in any of the, the rubrics that were, were created and never should be. Um, but would it make sense to begin to think about using resources in a creative way to maintain solvency for a hospital? I think that's important. And I think that's something that people need to think about. Yeah, that's a, those are great points, Alex. I think one I love is resource allocation and getting creative. So I think we all agree that obviously urgent, emergent cancer care should never supersede money. But at the same time, like you said, you got to keep the lights on and it's a balance. Um, and, and, you know, here we have done just that and been struggling with this as well. We've moved. I hate to pick on spine as well, but I will. 
Um, they make a lot of money. Why not, right? They're not here. Um, we moved a lot of our spine cases to our ambulatory surgery center to open up some more resources at the bigger institution so we could take care of more people. Now, that wasn't easy. There was a lot of growing pain. You know, there's a lot of trouble with doing that as well. Um, but, you know, it keeps the ship moving. You know, we still have to make money. And the other layer in all of this that I think uh, us as, you know, cancer providers that I didn't think about was we're a year in this now. A lot of the things that, you know, were elective and truly elective 10 months ago have now developed into not elective things anymore. And so when the floodgates started to reopen, for instance, for us about a couple months ago, um, allowing us to do more and more, uh, it, it truly was the floodgates opening. And, and now there were a lot more number-wise patients who had urgent, semi-urgent problems that we wouldn't traditionally think of um, as, as a, you know, needs to be done right now kind of case. And, and that has, you know, to an earlier point in the session, brought up more communication with other specialties that we never used to have. This is an institution level and, and ultimately national level conversation about surgical care. You know, how do we do this fairly and justly while making sure that you know, everybody gets at least what they need, maybe not what they want um, all the time. But that's a, you know, been, a, been a struggle, but I think we're working through it. Yeah, and you know, it's hard to use a principle-based approach to addressing this question for, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, the, the proximate stakeholders here are different, right? So it's hard to separate a stakeholder uh, as an institution that needs to make hundreds of millions of dollars from that individual patient with a lump that should come out soon, but maybe not tomorrow, uh, versus, of course, you know, the, the, the patient who will generate a lot of money for the hospital. Um, what I would argue here is that, of course, there's not going to be a clean answer, but that this needs to be an explicit, transparent conversation on the part of the individuals making this decision, that it's wrong for the, the, the bottom line, the money part, to be so separate and apart from the discussion of prioritization because of that ick factor that was brought up that it's brushed under the table. Uh, and the worst thing, of course, is for there to be lack of discussion of it. So for example, uh, uh, to be talking about spine cases without talking about uh, the, the issue of, of the reimbursement side. And, and we can use open heart as another example of a revenue, revenue generating service within our hospital that is obviously critically important, but the level of acuity for those cases may be debatable in certain situations about whether this needs to go now or in a week or in a month or in six months. Um, great questions and comments. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, and address my next question uh, uh, to Dr. Shindo. So uh, the informed consent process uh, is uh, always a, a tricky thing to talk about uh, among uh, busy surgeons and, and what that looks like in practice. Um, given your practice uh, uh, during the pandemic, what uh, happened uh, with your informed consent process and your perspectives on uh, what patients experienced uh, and uh, went through that shared decision-making process with you uh, that might have been different before, during, or after, hopefully after the pandemic? Well, you know, the informed consent, um, for, for example, for endocrine surgery, you know, in addition to the surgical risks and all that, um, I mean, I routinely would just discuss with the patient about the risk of COVID-19 and weighing the risks and benefits of doing the surgery at this time versus, for example, active surveillance for the thyroid cancers. Um, and that, that was part of my informed consent on every patient. Now, I think for, you know, head and neck, you know, there, there's, I mean, the protocol that was set up early on was that the oral pharyngeal cancers if there was equivalent outcomes in treatment, they would get the non-surgical treatment. Um, and I think that informed consent decisions. And I, you know, I did see a couple of oral pharyngeal cancers I happened to pick up for whatever reason. Um, and these are the discussions I had with them. Um, is, is um, you know, if you were to have surgery tours, um, whatnot, you know, there is, this COVID risk that you have to factor in. Um, and so that became part of the informed consent 
conversation. Alex, and I think it sorry, should. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I think it should. You know, I think patients need to to you know to be told that. I mean, I completely agree with Maisie on that. Uh, you know, the the obviously this was a topic that we knew we would be talking about and and reflecting on it. Um, uh, and one of the things that that was. It's sort of built into this decision-making informed consent process, but um, I thought about when I get an FNA on a neck node that I'm not that worried about, but the patient is super worried about it, you know, and, and you know, all the reassurance in the world doesn't really satisfy and you say, well, you know, not a big deal. I'm spending some healthcare resources though. We don't really think about it, but we are, you know, I'm spending other patients' money, the healthcare system's money to, to treat in, in, in many ways anxiety. Uh, but that doesn't seem wrong, mostly, you know, it's a rare patient and it's a patient who's clearly suffering. They will lose sleep at night. They're going to worry their head off when if you just get a biopsy and say, oh, look, it's just a benign node, you know, and, and that that becomes the a satisfactory outcome for that. And I, I, I encountered that in the informed consent process when we were thinking about when we were canceling cases, you know, cases that I had patients where you know, the anxiety factor was, was a substantial component, you know, that they did not, you know, either did not want to, uh, did not want to postpone, or in some cases, the opposite, you know, they, they wanted to wait. And uh, the weight that I gave that, um, you know, I decreased in the setting of a pandemic, and there's no question that I didn't give as much weight to their um, to their, to the patient's anxiety, but in many ways that counteracts the shared decision making, which you know you wrote about recently, Andy, uh, and uh, uh, the shared decision making that you have with a patient in, in this informed consent process, where you really value their unique perceptions and in how those play into, you know, you, you know the the consent process. Now, it, this isn't so much the the things that I'm telling them about the surgery, although there's a component of that, but really it's that relationship between the two of us as we think through what the right thing to do is. And, and how do you tell somebody, listen, I know you're anxious, but you know, there's a lot of other people who are, you know, super sick and we, we just can't, your anxiety doesn't matter right now, you know, in the face of this. And of course, with national attention, that helps a little bit, you know, everyone understands it, you know, that, that understands that there's something important going on, but bringing that to the individual person, it was hard and, and really pre presented a challenge. Um, Thank you. Especially gonna, the endocrine oh, patients. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No <laughs> kidding. No kidding. Uh, I'm going to transition uh, to a question from the audience related to virtual care. Uh, so uh, needless to say, uh, uh, we've all uh, figured out how to perform virtual care uh, rather quickly over the last year. Um, I think one component for otolaryngologists broadly, but certainly for head and neck surgeons, uh, is that much of what we do requires uh, uh, in-person examination. Uh, we are, by definition, looking and touching uh, in ways that can't be done over Zoom. Uh, and at least for some uh, primary care providers, um, their uh, virtually based practices have created rubrics where many patients who need in-person evaluation of their head and neck are being either referred or deferred to otolaryngologists. Um, how has that, uh, what's your perspective on that, number one? Uh, and number two, how have you integrated virtual care uh, into your practice in a way that hasn't separated that doctor-patient relationship uh, uh, that, that sometimes really does rely on being eye-to-eye -eye with someone? Start with you, Dr. Peter. Um, that's a very interesting question, uh, whoever asked that from the audience about primary care. I hadn't, I hadn't honestly really thought about that a whole lot, um, but now that you say that, I, I would agree. I have seen a lot more things that have been referred from a virtual visit where the patient never actually saw another provider. Um, and, and that has led to, you know, probably a lot of unnecessary referrals, to be honest, and bogged down, I wouldn't say bogged down necessarily, but, you know, um, created a little bit more uh, work for us to do. I will say from an overall standpoint, incorporating virtual care, I have a lot of conflicting thoughts and opinions on virtual care, to be honest, like you brought up. It's very hard. I don't like it, to be frank. I dislike, none of us probably like it because it's not how we train. It's not what we like. I like being face-to-face -face with a person. 
that being said, I feel like it has given me a lot of opportunities to meet with people and patients who I never would have been able to due to distance or travel restriction or transport problems. Um, it makes me uncomfortable a little bit seeing head and neck cancer patients, especially aerodigestive tract malignancies via telehealth. And so I honestly don't really do that a whole lot, um, unless it's, it's necessary. Um, endocrine patients though, Maisie, on the other hand, uh, a lot of times I'm a lot more comfortable doing that with them. Um, because usually you can, you know, I still like, you still like to feel their neck, of course, and do ultrasound, but you can gather a lot of information over a, a telehealth call. Um, and for us, and particularly here, I'm sure in a lot of places, we have a lot of patients who simply cannot do telehealth. They don't have broadband. They don't know how they're older. They, they, they can't, you know, make the visit. And so what turns into a telehealth visit turns into a phone call visit very fast where I am because they just can't figure out how to make it work. Um, and, and for me, that was, you know, that oftentimes is, is not really acceptable. So, um, personally, I do a lot of my telehealth slash virtual visits for post-op someone I've already seen taken care of should be doing okay, much more routine stuff and reserve most of the inpatient things for new patients, return patients, cancer surveillance, that sort of stuff. Um, but I'd be interested to see, you know, how other areas of the country have handled it. I'm wondering that if, if other people have had more luck incorporating it than I have. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, along with many of you have gotten a lot more comfortable with the durable sutures, uh, in terms of, uh, really relying upon virtual care for post-ops. But I do think that there's a difference, for example, after, you know, as Alex says, you do the big whack versus, uh, you do a smaller procedure in terms of whether someone, uh, needs to be seen face to face the next day or the next week or the next month. Uh, and, and I completely commiserate with you, Aaron, that uh, I want to see these patients back. Uh, I think that there is something fundamentally that can be lost um, uh, by not doing so. So uh, with that said, uh, Dr. Shindu, uh, your, your practice is different um, in that way. And I, I wonder how that's played into your surveillance post-op as well as your, your overall approach. Yeah, I, I think um, it changed a lot. Uh, and I think to some extent for the better for endocrine surgery. And I'll comment on the head and neck uh, patients in a bit, but so the greatest thing about um, telehealth and endocrine surgery is that, you know, you rely a lot on the ultrasound and they can get local ultrasound. And so one of the things, the nice things now about that is that you can look at cines and you know how adequate or inadequate the imaging study is. So at least the initial evaluation for us for many patients, unless they have a substernal goiter and their striderus, the initial evaluation can be done um, with video telehealth. And you can kind of get a sense of uh, the patient, at least whether they're, you know, um, striderus or, or whatnot, and they have a, mass, a huge mass. Uh, but a lot of that can be done with imaging done locally. And so a lot of the patients who wouldn't otherwise, who would otherwise would have to travel up five hours to see me, now actually get care, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, so that's completely changed. And, and I think there was this ethical, again, this, this dilemma of, you know, can we do things to protect our staff? Because if you bring people in unnecessarily and you, that you can otherwise do with telehealth, you are exposing the people around you potentially um, to COVID-19. So I think endocrine can definitely, you can utilize telehealth and, and deliver care probably that you wouldn't even be able to deliver prior to telehealth. I think head and neck, you know, if you have a oropharyngeal oral cavity, any of the aerodigestive tract laryngeal, you can't do it. I think it's just, it's virtually impossible. Uh, but things like, you know, cutaneous malignancies, um, salivary gland disease, I think probably you can start. And our head and neck folks, um, you know, they, they, you know, if they're coming from afar, they, they could start with a telehealth as an sort of like initial consult and just, you know, as long as the patient understands that, you know, at some point in time, they're going to need to come in for a physical exam. Um, and then post-op care, I think for endocrine, it's, it, it really works out great um, unless they're having a seroma or something you have to deal with and they got to come up. Um, so 
there's some humility with this too, re realizing that some of the services I provide where patients come in for a post-op wound check, it's, it's low value care. You know, it, they drove a couple hours, as you said, you know, uh, uh, Maisie, and you, you re recognize, you see them for, you know, and, and I usually take a long time with my patients, but some post-op patients, you see them for just a couple minutes. Look at the wound, look, Scar looks great. Let me talk to you a little bit about massage, you know, or Scar care. That so could have been done on the phone. It could have saved them all that time on that round trip and realizing that I had been putting people through it without even thinking about that. You're not even considering that as an option. You know, it was embarrassing in a way uh, to 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 recognize that that all of those patients who had come before had spent their a chunk of their day and imagine what would happen to any of us if someone made us take five hours out of our day for nothing. You know, it'd be terrible. It'd be infuriating. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be terrible. And of course, the patients are grateful and they think that that's what they need to do. And it's not you know necessarily casting that kind of perception, but uh, ultimately when you step back and look at it, I don't think it's, it's high value care. And I think this is a good sea change for us to, to take that more seriously. So I'll stay on that note a little bit uh, with regard to resource allocation. So I think uh, we have reconsidered what we need to do to practice the way we do versus what might be nice to have when we practice the way we do versus what is really completely unnecessary. Um, how has that played out in, in your thought process regarding your own practice? Uh, and what are the broader lessons uh, with regard to, to how you consider resource allocation within your own field of uh, scope? Uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Kitchen. Um, I think that's, you, yeah, you brought up, we've been talking a lot about, you know, what do you need? What do you want? And what, what's been ridiculous? And I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Alex. I did realize that I didn't, I wasn't doing the same stuff. You know, we were not as efficient, I think, as we probably could have been. And we all like to think we're very efficient. I know I did. Um, but in reality, we, we probably could deliver better care to more people. And we have been forced to do that um, a little bit more efficiently. And so for, for me, I think, you know, as much as I dislike telehealth, I do think it has helped a lot to, to make us you know, patients happier, have an equally good experience that they would have had good care. Um, other things for, for uh, our practice, um, you know, OR uh, scheduling has been a very, you know, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but a resource that I didn't appreciate, I would say, as much as I do now um, about, you know, just the dynamics of trying to to you know, we, sh we changed our entire way we schedule cases for our entire institution um, and still are in a totally different way we do it. So it's, it's been, that has been a real challenge and um, time consuming. So from that standpoint, I feel like a need that um, we don't currently have that I wish we had would be, you know, better um, ability to schedule a little bit easier. So, so that's a, another thing that has affected our practice quite a bit. Shindo, you spoke a little bit about this with regard to thinking about uh, the role for laryngoscopy uh, uh, in your practice and, and aerosol generation. And, and I will uh, opine that we've actually moved in the other direction uh, as we have more data showing that perhaps a diagnostic uh, flexible laryngoscopy is perhaps not as aerosol generating as we thought it was. And it's really the procedurally based ones that we need to be extra careful with. Um, has that played a role? And there was a specific question asked about transoral scopes um, uh, uh, or transnasal scopes, whether or not you use anesthetic uh, and whether or not uh, perhaps aerosol generation just from spraying the nose may be an issue. Is that a trade-off that is for you to decide on whether or not a scope might be slightly more uncomfortable versus a patient? Uh, uh, and how does that play into the, the overriding message of individual decision-making versus public health ethics? Well, that's, you know, that's, it comes back to, um, and I always think about like, okay, you know, I need to be thinking about not only protecting what I want to do, but protecting those around me. So, uh, you know, unless it's absolutely critical, you know, we, we I just scope them the day of the procedure because they would have had a COVID test already. And, and just before the intubate, I'll scope them. I mean, we have the high def monitors. What's the difference? Um, they come to the operating room, you know, and, and they get scoped. But also the way we anesthetize, I've changed the way I do that. You know, it used to be we, we would have these sprays and all that stuff, which sometimes are just, you know, coughing and going nuts. And 
So I switched to just using like topical gel mixed with a little bit of aspirin in a syringe and I just drip it. And, and I surprisingly, I found that they don't cough, they don't sneeze, they don't do anything with that. And I just let it sit for 10 minutes, go about doing what I need to do. And then if I even need to scope them in the clinic, it doesn't cause all the sneezing and coughing. Um, so these are just little things um, that, you know, minor changes um, that I've modified. <laughs> Yeah, and I completely agree with you. Uh, and and I, I would have just kind of put this back in the, in the term of principles here that uh, there are some decisions that we make as professionals about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate um, that very well might not benefit every individual patient, but overall are probably better for uh, us all, uh, patients as well as providers. Uh, so that's, that, that's my uh, overriding comment there. There is a question in the chat and we're almost out of time. Um, I'll address this one uh, to Dr. Langerman. So uh, what about the patient who says, you know, doc, I really don't care that I have absorbable stitches. I really wanna come back and see you next week. It would make me feel a lot better. Uh, and there's really no good medical justification for that exam other than assuaging a patient who wants to see you back. Uh, and of course we can answer in that narrow scope, but also in the scope of how far do you stretch that public health approach versus uh, the fact that fundamentally we are doctors taking care of sick and scared patients who want to see you in person sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that's right. And that's reflected in a number of the, it's a great question, a number of the conversations, uh, this idea of how do you, you know, to what degree are we responsible for the whole human being and not the single organ that we're dealing with at a given moment? And um, so, you know, I, I think factoring into the calculus might be how risky they are. If it's like, yo doc, I'm the unvaccinated guy who doesn't wear masks anywhere and I'm doing a lot of risky behavior and I wanna come into your clinic. I mean, if it, I, before this pandemic, if someone came in hacking and coughing and had a real obvious sickness, we'd usually ask them to just come back another day, you know? So we don't, we try not to expose everyone to, to risk. So that might factor into it. If I was, if it were something where it seemed, you know, let's say we're at the, uh, uh, in a big surge and it was really risky to have patients even coming into clinic, maybe I meet him in the parking lot. I mean, that's sort of like going above and beyond, but we're talking about unusual situations here. So you could, you could maybe find a middle ground where you're not putting others at risk. Um, recognizing, and, and I, I wish I had said this earlier, and, and I think it, 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 in the professionalism concept it is one of the things I, you know, when we were doing our work, you know, there was this esprit de corps and, you know, I would be trying to go in and show the residents, look, I'm taking just as much risk as you are, but also reflecting and I had a colleague, you know, help me think through this, that, you know, anytime I put myself at excessive risk, I'm really depriving, potentially depriving the healthcare system of another healthcare worker who's healthy. You know, if I get sick, we have one less person to take care of patients. And so any unnecessary risk is probably unnecessary that would probably factor into my calculus at well. If I thought that the patient was going to put me at a lot of risk, I might say this isn't really necessary, but let's, you know, let's telehealth or let's find a way or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't know, but it's a tough question and you know, it would be a case-based individual decision. Yeah, we've had time to time when a patient comes into the clinic already and refuses to wear a mask. And then, you know, my responsibility is to the patient, but my responsibility is also to the rest of our healthcare system and the patient coming in after them. So what do I do in that situation? And that's, that's a big dilemma. Do I turn them away, you know, and not see them? Um, and so we've had to work those things out. Yeah, and that really comes down to the concept of non-abandonment. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think uh, we all recognize that we have a supererogatory responsibility to take care of people in need who are sick and who are scared and who sometimes uh, really rely on that uh, individualized uh, and personal care that we provide. I think that's why most of us went into this field. Uh, so uh, I would argue that in certain situations um, that post-op appointment should be in person, uh, that it is indeed the right thing to do. Again, taking public health uh, metrics into account in terms of masks and screening and so on, but that the simple fact of coming into the office to be seen for a post-op in certain situations will override uh, the infection control concerns uh, in that specific setting. Yeah, uh, and I'll tell you what, I, what I've done in that situation, just, I mean, I don't know what else you all do, but I basically just tell my staff, don't go in the room, just put the patient in the room. Mm -hmm. I put an N95 on, 
I see the patients and I tell them to shut down that room for you know whatever time frame, whatever the, the university policy is, and then don't put another patient in that room. And I think that's the best you can do. And you kind of compromise and you take care of the patient and you take care of everybody else around you. The luxury yeah. that we can do that kind of thing, you know, that we can spare the room and you know that, you know, that um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we are uh, at time. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panel for a truly uh, fantastic and thoughtful approach uh, to some very difficult problems. Hopefully we contextualize this a bit for the audience in a way that will be helpful and we'll move this conversation forward. Uh, thanks to Cosm HNS and Dr. Deschler uh, for giving us this opportunity. Fantastic moderating, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, very Andrew. Nice. And uh, I wanna thank the panel, uh, not only for your expertise, uh, but for your openness, um, you know, that's really what, you know, we wanted this to be about, you know, it's what we're about in the hallways and what we're about when we're having coffee at the breaks. And it's nice to see us be about it uh, uh, amongst all our friends uh, on the podium. So we really, really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you um, for the opportunity. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to the next panel, we'll take a small break and then we'll uh, log back <laughs> in in a second. Bye-bye now. Bye, everybody. <laughs>